Good evening. A very warm welcome to each and every one. Especially if you're a visitor, you're very, very welcome. And we do have at least one visitor with us, Seth Rigglesworth, who has come from Paul to bring us God's word. And thank you very much for coming, Seth. We look forward to your ministry this evening. Um, just for a few things from the bulletin. Um, if you don't know, there is a, a, a holiday Bible to send you an email with that link on. So if you want to attend that and have a bit of input or find out what's going on, please do. Uh, I'd ask you to pray for the regular events coming up this week, the coffee morning and the little caterpillars and the Friday club and cornerstone. That would be good if you could remember those in your evangelical church. So if you could remember that through the week, that would be good. If you could pray for, we can pray for one another, that would be very helpful. So without any further ado, there is tea and coffee. Did I say that after the service? I may have forgotten, but there is tea and coffee after the service. So please just get to know you better. Uh, so I'll hand over now to, uh, for, to Seth and uh, you will see me after the second hymn shortly. But don't worry, you'll be okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for your welcome, everybody. And I'd just like to reiterate the, uh, the warmth, the love, the friendship extended from Parbold over to North Preston here. Um, I know David quite well. We meet regularly together for prayer along with a, a few other ministers. And so there's a strong relationship between us personally, uh, but also in praying for your church. We often, uh, as we pray for other local churches, we remember your church and the work that goes on here. So it's nice to be able to uh, feel this really reminded of the reason that we gather for worship. We're going to read from Psalm 32. These words, originally words of David, the king of Israel, but surely words uh, that each and every believer in the Lord Jesus Christ can use as a form of worship. Psalm 32, a masculine of David, but whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer, Selah. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin, Selah. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters they shall not reach him. Well, isn't that the, the basis of all of our worship of God as believers in Christ? That it is a blessed thing to be forgiven our iniquity. We're going to sing on that theme, uh, number 615 in your books. I know not why God's wondrous grace to me has been made known. Uh, nor why, unworthy as I am, he called me as his own. We might be able to explain how we've been saved. We might be able to explain the work of Christ, his death on the cross. And yet, uh, will we ever be able to plumb the depths of God's love for sinners, even his enemies, even you, even me? Let's sing in worship and adoration and praise. 615.
Please join me in prayer as we continue to worship God for the forgiveness he has offered. Our Lord God and Heavenly Father, just as it was David's confession, so also it is our confession this evening, especially for those of us, particularly for those of us who know the Lord Jesus Christ personally. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven. Blessed is the one whose sin is covered. That simple truth will forever be the theme of our praise and our adoration and our worship of you. We can say, like David, that when we kept silent, when we tried to hide our sin, when we ignored our iniquity, when we lived as though your law had no claim upon us, our bones, as it were, wasted away, your hand lay heavy upon us, our guilt remained on our own heads. And then, wonder of wonders, we acknowledge our sin to you. We did not hide. We did not cover over our iniquity. But instead, in transgression, our confession, uh, in confessing our transgressions to the Lord, you respond not as you ought, not as you have the right to, in judgment, but with forgiveness. You forgave the iniquity of my sin. Our Lord God, as we come to worship you this evening, we pray that you'd help us as we pick up this theme of forgiveness and worship and the salvation that you've offered. Father, with trepidation, we even ask that you would show us more of our sin. Show us how deeply sin runs through our natures, through our hearts, how persistently sin affects our thoughts, our words, our deeds, how pervasive sin is in our relationships and in our culture and in the world in which we live, how much damage sin has caused to the creation. Father, would you show us more of sin so that we might realize more of what it cost Christ to give his life to pay for our sin, that we might not be sunk in despair at the depth of sin, but be lifted to even greater joy and thankfulness and praise for Jesus Christ, our Saviour, the one who has redeemed us from our sins. Father, help us in our worship. Help us to be wholehearted and sincere in the prayers that we offer. Give us the strength and the grace to listen to your word, to the instruction and to the encouragement you give us therein. And Father, would you bless us with a unity, a closeness, a love for one another. Not for its own sake, not because a church is a, some kind of social club, but because each one of us knows and loves the Lord Jesus Christ. We are brothers and sisters gathered in worship. May that be evident in our conversation, in our time together, and even in our worship. May the unbeliever amongst us see that there is a power at work in us which doesn't originate with our own strength, but originates from you. May they see Jesus Christ at work in his church. Bless us. For your name's sake we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to read again from the scriptures, this time from Mark's gospel, and we'll be considering this passage later on. Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, and I'll start reading at verse 35. Rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him, and they found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, Let us go on to the next towns, that I may preach there also. For that is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. And a leper came to him, 
imploring him. And kneeling, said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. But he went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in desolate places, and people were coming to him from every quarter. And when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home, and many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door, and he was preaching the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men, and when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts. Why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately, Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier? To say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise, take up your bed, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose, and immediately picked up his bed, and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed, and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. He went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as he reclined at table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. We'll be considering verse 1 to 12 of chapter 2 uh, in a few moments. But before we do, we're going to sing again number 548 from your hymn books, a confession of our dependence upon the Lord Jesus Christ. He has come not to call the righteous, but he has come to call sinners. And this hymn is a confession of our own sin and therefore our need of Jesus as our Saviour. We'll stand when the music begins to sing 548.
Let's join together in prayer. Let's pray. Father, what a wonderful thing it is to be able to say, I know whom I have believed and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Thank you for the amazing grace, Father, that lays hold on us sinners who do not seek you, do not want you, do not love you, do not desire you, and yet in such mercy and grace you reach down and you rescue us. And we just thank you and praise you for this amazing grace in which we stand. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ who has washed us and clothed us in his own righteousness. And we thank you, Father, that through him we have this access to pray and to bring before you the needs of ourselves, of our nation, our world, and of our fellowship. And Father, we would ask for your help and your blessing for our fellowship here. We thank you for the witness that you've given us over many years to reach out to this community. And Father, you know the plans that we have, please, that you would bless, that we would have a holiday Bible club this year at which you would watch over every detail of the planning that you would be with everyone who meets tomorrow even through the zoom meeting father to plan out what is going to happen by your grace would you lead them would you help them would you enable them to know your mind and to do your will and lord we pray that as you guide them and help them to bring the word of god to bear upon the children we pray for those children who we don't know will be there but we know that you will bring them and we ask that you would prepare their hearts that they will come with a sense of their need, with an understanding that they are sinners who cannot save themselves, but they are sinners whom the Lord Jesus is willing and able to save. Lord, have your hand upon this meeting tomorrow and bless it and those who will be part partakers of this work. Father, we do have needs in the fellowship as we have already prayed. There are those who are frail and weak who can't be here this evening, who are struggling with old age or illness and we do pray lord that you would draw near to those who would love to be here but cannot be here this evening we ask that you would have a word of comfort a word of encouragement a reminder lord that even down to gray hairs you are their god and that you will never leave them nor forsake them would you please comfort them would you please help them father we do pray for your hand upon david white for healing we pray for Margaret Critchley, Lord, that you would please help her to uh, be lifted out of this difficult place she may find herself. And we ask for your hand upon Peter and Margaret, that they will have all that they need, Lord, that their strength may be returned and that they may be able to continue to care for one another. Lord, we do thank you that we have the unity that you've given us in the fellowship. And we thank you for David and for the elders we thank you, Lord, that you have guided and kept and enabled uh, the, your word to be brought to us faithfully to build us up and to help and to guide us. We ask that you would help us, Father, that you would help us to be not only hearers but doers of your word, that you would help us to be those who hear the good news, rejoice in the good news of Christ and tell others, those that we meet daily, those that we meet as we go to work or school or our neighbours and friends and even members of our family, help us to be those who tell of Jesus and his love for sinners and his willingness and his power to save. So please help us, Father, and bless us and guide us by your Spirit. And Lord, we do are very conscious that there are churches in our area who have no pastor, and we ask that you would please provide for them we ask that through this time without a, a pastor you would guide them and keep them and that there would not be disunity come in and, and scatter or cause problems within the fellowships. We ask please help them. Please bring them the pastors that they need, the elders that they need, the members that they need, Father, to continue the work of the gospel. So we ask for those fellowships particularly who are without a pastor that you would help them, please. So, Father, we thank you for your grace to us, for your mercy to us, and for your presence with us. And we ask that you would continue with us now, please, as we bring our prayers and our worship to you. 
as we sing to you now the, 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 for your glory and your honor. Lord, help us by your spirit in all that we do to honor and glorify you. We ask it, please, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to take our hymn books and we are going to turn to hymn number 712, Lord of the Cross of Shame, set my cold heart aflame with love for you, my Saviour and my Master. How sad that we actually need to pray that prayer so often, don't we? How often we forget the wonder of our Lord and all that he has done for us. So we sing together, 712, Lord of the Cross of Shame. Let's make it our prayer, set our cold heart to shame, a flame. Amen. We're going to be looking at Mark chapter 2 this evening, so if you've got a Bible with you or if you've got your hands free to be able to do that, then uh, I'd encourage you to turn to Mark chapter 2 in your Bibles. I want to begin uh, with a quotation. Um, A fairly well-known celebrity, a self-professed atheist, was once asked or challenged, you might say, look, if you ever got to the point where you were at the pearly gates of heaven, you were confronted with God face to face, what is it that you would say to him? And this atheist responded in this way. He'd say, how dare you? I'd say, bone cancer in children? What's that about? How dare you? How dare you create a world to which there is so much misery that is not our fault? It's not right. It is utterly, utterly evil, he said. Why should I respect a capricious, mean-minded, stupid God who creates a world that is so full of injustice and pain? That's what I would say to him if I was ever to see him face to face. I wonder how you'd respond if you had opportunity. Whatever you think about the language used in that quotation, his description of God as a a mean, capricious, stupid God, surely, as believers, that generates uh, responsive emotions in your own heart. And yet, as much as you would be wanting to respond, how, how would you? What words would you pluck out to respond to him? Imagine, not if it was a celebrity that you're dealing with in theory, but if it was one of your own family members, or neighbours, or colleagues, or friends, sat around your own kitchen table at home. The argument is undoubtedly a forceful argument. It is full of emotion, and it's difficult to know 
what words do I pluck up next? How do I respond without sounding like I just don't care about the issue of seeming unjust suffering in the world today? What do we say next? The argument is certainly forceful, but it's not a new argument, actually. And it's not a particularly sophisticated argument. It's not a new argument. There's humans been asking the question of suffering in the world almost since humanity began. There are whole books of the Bible dedicated to this one specific question. Why is there suffering and what is God doing about it? The argument that undermines this man's atheism, who I've just quoted, is fairly simplistic. The argument that he's proposing there is that basically he sees no space for a God, no possibility of a God, who cannot or does not immediately end all suffering. There's no way for him to think of a God who cannot or will not immediately end that unjust suffering. Now, he might want to add caveats to that. Well, uh, I'm speaking about unjust suffering here. I'm not, not on about uh, the, the wrong done by men to other men. But why can't God stop the, the unfair things, the things that we can't control? He might want to add caveats. But at, at root, his principle is, there is no space for a God who does not immediately end unjust suffering. Now, to such an atheist, then, one of the biggest challenges that they can face is when they come up against a God who chooses not to end suffering immediately, even though he is able. If such a God exists, that's a big challenge to the whole way of thinking of the atheist. Now, today, I've, this evening, I've brought us to Mark chapter 2, and we're going to look at the healing of the paralyzed man. My intention is not to give you one pithy little statement that you can unravel from your pocket when you next sat around that kitchen table to, to read out to your friend so that you might continue the conversation in a meaningful direction. I'm not intending to give you a neat little answer to take away like that. But what I hope that you will see from Mark chapter 2 is that Jesus doesn't deal with unjust suffering in the ways that you or I or your atheist friends might expect him to. He doesn't deal with it in the way that you might expect him to. And what I want to show you, whether you are a sufferer yourself, whether you are a believer who wants to respond to your atheist friends, or whether tonight there are skeptics among us, I want to show you that Jesus not responding to suffering in the way that we expect doesn't, in fact, make him evil, weak, capricious, or stupid but rather shows us that Jesus has come to deal with an even greater need, an even greater need that you have, an even greater issue even than unjust, unjust suffering in the world. To um, assess the uh, passage that we're looking at, Mark 2, 1 to 12, we're going to do it in two parts. First, we're going to look at what Jesus doesn't do, and then uh, we're going to look at what Jesus does do. So first, let's notice what Jesus doesn't do. Now, before we dive into chapter 2, I just want to uh, make the, the fairly obvious statement that Mark, as he wrote his gospel, wasn't writing separate little parcels of stories about Jesus. That's often the way we interact with these parcels. We might teach uh, these verses this week in Sunday school, and uh, the next set of verses next week in Sunday school, or likewise sermons uh, get preached in, in parcels like that. But actually, Mark is writing a book. Uh, uh, the 16 chapters here, all about what Jesus has done. And the end events are related to the beginning events, and all the, th all the way through, they're, they're intermingled. And so we read not just verse 1 to 12 of chapter 2, but we read a bit before and a bit after. If you look in chapter 1, what Mark has shown us already is that Jesus is a real powerful healer. Already, in one chapter, his ministry has only just started, and yet Mark has shown us Jesus driving out an evil spirit that nobody else could get control of. Driving out the evil spirit. He's shown us Jesus healing a leper, of which there is only one other example in the whole of biblical history. It is unprecedented, almost, that Jesus should be able to heal a leper in the way he does. We've even seen Mark showing us Jesus sitting, as it were, at his own little uh, dropping clinic, uh, not really, but he, sitting in a house and crowds from the towns around him coming to bring the sick and the ill to Jesus, for him to touch them, for him to bless them, for him to heal them. Jesus has already been shown to be a very powerful healer. And so then we get into chapter 2, and 
there were many gathered together. There was not even room at the door. And verse 3, they came bringing to him a paralytic, a man who is paralyzed. His legs don't work. He can't walk. Perhaps he never has been able to walk. But we don't know the details of his illness that he endures. But certainly at this moment, he cannot walk. And so his friends, he's dependent upon them. They pick him up and they carry him to Jesus. And they get to the room, and children, you perhaps know the story at this point. What happens when they try and go through the door? Can he get through? He can't do it. Uh, And they try and push past, and maybe they they offer trying to pass him through the window, but whether it's the crowds who just wanted to keep their own space in the room, or whether it's just the ingenuity of the friends, they had a sneaky plan and a clever little trick. And they decided, well, let's go around the side of the building, and we'll go up these steps, and we'll start digging through the roof. And so they pull off the mud, and they pull off the straw, and they pull off the sticks, and they make a big hole. It must have been big enough for them at least to fit a man down, not just a child. And so they got him on his bed, perhaps there were four friends, and they they lowered him through on his mat, and they lowered him down. And the crowd, you can imagine them holding their hands up and receiving him, is the first crowd surfer in history. Here we go. And he gets passed towards the front of the crowd, and he's laid at the feet of Jesus. Now, here's the question. What What is Jesus going to do for this man? The paralyzed man, his legs don't work, he's so poorly, he's dependent upon others for all that he needs, and they've brought him to Jesus. What is Jesus going to do with him? What is the most likely thing you would expect Jesus to do, given what we've seen of Jesus in all of chapter 1? Mark wants you to remember that man with the demon, well, he was healed. That man with leprosy, well, well, he was healed. All them people, that stream of people, those crowds, all them were healed. Well, here comes the paralyzed man. Man, and he's laid before Jesus, what do you think Jesus is going to do? What do you think Jesus would do for you if you had the opportunity to take him down to Manchester Children's Hospital and to see all those poorly children in their beds there and in their wheelchairs? What do you think Jesus would do if you took him to see the premature babies at Wigan Infirmary? who are fighting for their lives? What do you think Jesus would do if you were able to take him to Ukraine and see the war and see the victims of the war, the children without parents anymore, the wives without husbands, the soldiers conscripted to fight in a war that they don't even believe in, they don't want any part in? What do you think Jesus would do if you had opportunity to take him and lead him by the hand to your own house? where the troubles in your family are, and your illnesses, and your difficulties. What do you think Jesus would do if you could bring him to them and put the unjust suffering at the feet of Jesus? What would he do? You know, you know the story of the paralyzed man reasonably well, I expect, most here. And because of that, it's easy for the shock of the situation to simply pass us by. By the way, if you were fabricating the gospel accounts, if you were just pretending that you were Mark and that you'd really seen Jesus and you were making these stories up, what would you have Jesus do next? You want Jesus to be the hero of your story, right? You know what Jesus would do next. You'd make him heal the man. Hey, presto, everybody, round of applause. Brilliant Jesus. Let's all worship him. Let's read verse 5 to see what Jesus actually does when the paralyzed man is there in front of him and allow the shock to hit you fresh. Verse 5, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, what would go through your mind if you were the paralyzed man? Surely you'd be thinking something along the lines of, Hang on, Jesus, I, I think you've missed the point here. That's, this is not the reason we made a hole in the roof. Okay? Perhaps you're also thinking, What do you mean my sins are forgiven? What are you implying? This man may have had these poorly legs from when he was born. What have I done? Is this my fault, these broken legs? These these legs that don't work? Perhaps, though, in order to feel the man's response, you don't need to imagine yourself as him. Perhaps you feel it yourself. Perhaps... Time and time again, perhaps for years, you have been bringing your difficulties, your unjust suffering to Jesus and laying it at his feet. Your bereavements, your broken marriages, your wayward children for whom you've prayed for many years, 
your poor health, your addictions, or depression. And what do you find in return? Well, Jesus keeps speaking to you, yes, but he just came, seems, seems to keep speaking past the issue. Jesus, have you even noticed what issue I've brought to you here? Why is it that you keep on speaking just about my sin? Same old, same old. Jesus, can't you notice what is here in front of you? Haven't you seen what I've brought to you for healing? Perhaps you're a skeptic this evening. And in this little account, you see, well, just more fuel for the fire. Ha, there go the church again. Always concerned about other people's morality, but never really bothering to deal with the suffering and the injustice and the needs of the world. Let's take a moment to consider why doesn't Jesus heal this man? Why doesn't Jesus do what they and the crowd surely are expecting him to do? Why doesn't he say to him at that moment, get up and walk? Two things I want to draw your attention to in response to that. One is for Jesus to speak of his sin rather than healing him is not out of step with Jesus' ministry so far. It is true that in chapter 1, Jesus has had a powerful healing ministry. But if you've got a Bible in front of you, just look down at chapter 1, verse 15. Jesus' first words recorded in Mark's Gospel. Jesus is saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the Gospel, or believe the good news. This is the message that Jesus is bringing. He's not come to say, here I am, the miracle worker. He's come to say, repent and believe. You see that repeated if you look at verse 38. The disciples grab him, they say, everybody is looking for you. Yeah, you know why they're looking for him, because they're all poorly too. And yet Jesus says, let's go on to the next towns that I may preach there also. You see it in Jesus' cleansing of the leper, actually. Jesus didn't just tell the leper, be healed. He tells him, be clean, verse 41. For Jesus to say to him, be made clean, is not just a synonym for be healed. You see that in the way Jesus instructs the man to then go and make the sacrifices that are required of him. He doesn't just want him to be healed. He wants him to be made clean, ceremonially clean. He wants his sin to be dealt with. And then we read down to chapter 2, uh, verse 17. The, those who are well have no need of a doctor. But what sort of doctor am I? Jesus answers the question. I've come... Not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Throughout Jesus' ministry and on throughout the gospel, Jesus will heal as a demonstration of his power, but he's not simply concerned with a healing ministry. He's come to deal with sin. And so secondly, in answering why Jesus doesn't heal this man immediately, we can offer this observation. Although Jesus doesn't deal with the man's most urgent need, Surely you'd agree it was one of his most urgent needs, the need to be able to walk again. Although Jesus doesn't deal with his most urgent need, he does deal with his greatest need. He does deal with his greatest need. Why is this man paralysed? Actually, it's something of a trick question. You don't know the details. Mark doesn't provide them. None of the other gospel accounts provide them. We don't know why uh, the man's paralysed. And yet... I asked the question not to get you to tell me about this man, this individual. I asked the question more to get you to think about why is anybody paralyzed? In the words of that atheist who I quoted at the beginning, why does there even exist a parasite in this world whose sole purpose is to burrow into the eyes of children and feed on their flesh until they die? Why does such a creature exist in God's good creation? Why does degenerative disease de exist? Why does dementia exist? Why does motor neuron disease exist? Why does paralysis exist? Why are these things here? The Bible is clear on that answer. And the answer is sin. Not your particular sin is the cause of your particular ailment. That's not the connection that the Bible makes. But rather... That the suffering, the, what, is been, what has been termed the unjust suffering of living in this world and all of its brokenness. It is only here because of the sin in general of 
humanity. When Adam and Eve first sinned against God, when they first turned their backs upon him, the result was a broken world. God cursed this world in which we live. Why did he do it? Was it spiteful vengeance? Ha! I'll get them, God said. I'll show them. This will serve them right for turning their backs on me. I'm the only good around. If they're going to keep living in my world, I'm going to make it as difficult as possible. And so he curses the world. Is that what went on? Well, that's not what you're familiar with as you read Genesis, is it? No, it wasn't spiteful vengeance which caused God to curse the world. Think of it this way. Where does life come from? Maybe the children can think about that question. Where does life come from? You might trace it back to your mums and dads. But then you're only left with the question, where does their life come from? Where does life come from? Who gives all life? The answer is God. He's the creator. Everything that lives only lives because God made it. God is the source of all life. Who defines what is good? Who gets to say what is good or not good? Actually, God is the one who says what is good or not good. And when you listen to the creation accounts, and God said at the end of, the day, of each day, he saw what he'd made and it was good. And at the end of the seventh day, it was very good. God is saying what he has made is good because it fits with what he intended. God is the source of all goodness. Where does love come from? Not Adam and Eve. They were the first marriage, the first man and woman in a marriage. But they weren't the first to love. The first to love was the Father loving the Son through the Spirit. God is the source of all love. Life, goodness, love, you could go on, order, beauty. It comes from God. What happens then when humanity turns our backs upon God? The inevitable result is a world of death, hatred, evil, and disorder. The curse that is on creation is not God's spiteful anger just causing terror because he's frustrated at us. The curse on creation is the inevitable result of our sin against a good, loving creator God. Well, now that means there's an implication for us to follow through on. You see, if, like that atheist I quoted at the beginning, you can recognize that the effects or the consequences of our sin are hateful in this world, if the damage done to the world is to be hated and abhorred, then consider this. What will be the result for those who enter eternity, not just enduring the consequences of their own sin, but enduring God's wrath and anger against their sin? Not when God just allows our sin to do its own work, but when God actively punishes our sin. If the world today seems hateful, that atheist I quoted at the beginning is going to have a shock when he experiences an eternity of God's judgment against sin. And when he's treated not just as one of God's broken creation, but as an enemy of God. The suffering that we experience in this world, and I don't mean to say this in a way that belittles or minimizes your own hurt, but in all truthfulness, the suffering that we experience in this world will be as a minor inconvenience compared to the hurt, the pain of suffering the eternity of the wrath of God against sin. The greatest need of this paralyzed man, the thing that he needed the most was not a new pair of legs. After all, what good would a new pair of legs be, even if he gets another 70 years use out of them, when he's got to face an eternity of God's wrath against his sin? What good would it be? The man's greatest need is not a new pair of legs, but his sin to be dealt with. Forgiveness of sin. Likewise, for you, your greatest need is not a spouse, is not your health returning, is not a new job, is not freedom from your addiction. Your greatest need 
perhaps not your most urgent, but without doubt your greatest need, is your sin to be forgiven. This is what Jesus came for. Not simply to make our legs work again, but to deal with our sin. Let's look secondly at what Jesus does do in this passage. You see, our surprise as we read through and shock is that Jesus didn't heal. He offers forgiveness instead. But for the religious leaders of the day, their surprise, interestingly, is quite the opposite. Verse 7, uh, uh, verse 6, some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts. Verse 7, why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Of course, Jesus knows what they're thinking in their hearts, and he responds with a question. Verse 9, which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed, and walk? I wonder if the children know or would offer an answer to that question. Just think about it uh, in the quietness here. Which is easier to say to someone? Is it easier to say to them, your sins are forgiven, or is it easier to say, get up and walk? Just want to think about Maybe one to chat about over tea tonight when you get home. It depends, really, on what you want to achieve. You see, if you just want to be someone who looks good, who looks really religious, and someone who looks really important, if you just want to get people to listen to you and follow you, then probably it's easier to say your sins are forgiven. Do you know why? Because it sounds wonderful. Surely that's what everybody needs. Your sins are forgiven. And here's this man offering forgiveness of sins. That sounds good, doesn't it? But the other benefit of it is not just that it sounds good, but that nobody can see whether you've achieved it or not. You can't see with your eyes whether someone's had their sins forgiven. You can't taste it or touch it or hold it. You can't smell it. You know, if you're a believer, many confess that actually they can feel it. They they know a difference in their lives. But you can't see it or hold it, or touch it, or measure it in another person. Well, that's beneficial then, isn't it? It's quite easy then to say your sins are forgiven. But which is easier actually to do? Which is easier to accomplish? How hard was it for Jesus to heal the man? What did he have to do? Again, children, think about that. What did, the, what did Jesus have to do to heal the man? Verse 11 gives us the answer. Jesus says, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. Verse 12, what happens? And he rose. That was it. I told you this had to do, just speak. Just like when he created. The whole world was made just by Jesus speaking. Let there be light, Jesus said, and there was light. Let there be legs on this man. Well, he already had legs, you know, but they weren't working. Let there be, and it came. And it happened. It wasn't difficult. It was easy in that sense. How hard was it for Jesus to be able to forgive this man? What did Jesus have to do for that? Do you know, that was costly. That was real costly. Interestingly, it's in this passage that we first see opposition between the religious leaders and Jesus. It comes up in verse 7. That's the first time. Why does this man speak like that? Uh, Nobody should be doing that. That's blasphemy. We read down to verse 16. Again, the religious leaders are questioning, why does Jesus eat with the tax collectors and the sinners? Why does he associate with them ruffins? Do you know, this opposition develops so quickly that by verse 6 of chapter 3, probably on the same page if you've got a Bible in front of you, chapter 3, verse 6, the Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel about how to destroy Jesus. Within a chapter, they've decided, we're going to kill this guy. Why? Why? Because, chapter 2, verse 7, he dared forgive someone. For Jesus to forgive this man is going to cost him his own life. You see, for Jesus to offer forgiveness to him, he doesn't do it just by ignoring his sin. God never does that. God never ignores sin. That's not how he offers forgiveness. Jesus is only able to offer forgiveness by paying for his sin. In the language that we've used earlier, it's the creator taking on the curse of creation. And so what we're going to see, in order for Jesus to offer forgiveness, the one who has been the giver and sustainer of life is going to have to die. The one who defines goodness is going to become responsible for evil. 
The one who is the source of all love is going to be hated and ridiculed and rejected. Not only ridiculed and rejected and hated by men, his creation, but to suffer the hatred and the wrath of God against sin. By the time Jesus gets to the cross, he is not simply being killed or being murdered by wicked men. He is being judged for all the unjust suffering that has been caused by humanity. On the cross, Jesus was taking the blame and the punishment for such sins as acts of terrorism, for such sins as the racism and murderous violence that drove the slave trade, for such sins as perhaps the most severe sexual perversions, and for such sins as your lies, your lust, your greed, and your selfishness. He wasn't just being killed, he was being judged. And so now, let's ask Jesus' question to ourselves again. Which is easier? To say to the paralyzed man, get up and walk, or to say, your sins are forgiven? Well, if we understand what it costs Jesus to be able to offer forgiveness, we can see a fresh implication of what Jesus is asking here. You see, he's not just asking about the ability of, is Jesus able, or more, uh, is it more e- is it, is it more easily possible for him to make him walk or more easily possible for him to forgive him? But also there's a question here about Jesus' willingness. Is he more willing to heal the man or is he more willing to forgive him? You see, to those who, like the paralyzed man, see all of their brokenness, not just the pain of their unjust suffering, but the fault of their own sin, What they see in Jesus' question is here is a man who was willing and able to forgive even my sin. You know, those people, like the atheist I quoted at the beginning, they would love to have the opportunity to grab Jesus by the ear and drag him through history to the scenes of the most severe unjust suffering that we've known in this world. They would grab him and take him to Auschwitz, wouldn't they? They would grab him and take him to the children's hospitals. They would grab him and take him to the jungles and the tribes and uh, all those places where advanced healthcare hasn't reached. They would grab him and take him to the war zones. And they would demand of Jesus, Jesus, what are you going to do about this suffering? Why have you ignored it? Don't you care? Can't you do anything? Won't you fix it? And they expect, in their pride, to be able to catch Jesus with a red face in shame. As though he was stuttering out some sort of apology. Oh, so, sorry, I, I, I missed this one. Uh, I've done other good things. Uh, let, me, let me tell you about these, uh, these 5,000 people who were all fed one afternoon. That, that was a good thing, wasn't it? And they expect to catch Jesus out on the back foot. As though here's some suffering that he's missed. Do you know, if that were ever the case, you can imagine Jesus responding not with shame, not stuttering out an apology, but by taking that doubter to the cross and asking them a question in return. You ask me, you ask me whether I care. What do you see here as I hang on the cross? I care enough that I was willing to die for those who hated me, that they might be freed from the sin and its consequences. You ask me whether I'm unjust. In fact, here at the cross, you see me suffering under your injustice for the sake of your injustice. You ask me whether I'm too weak to fix this problem. Well then, answer me this. Which is easier? To say to this man, your sins are forgiven. Or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. Which is easier? What have I done? Now here's the conclusion I want to end with. Jesus did not come simply as a conjurer of cheap tricks to make your life a little bit more easier 
a little bit more smooth going. He didn't just come to rescue you from difficulty. He came to be your saviour. Your saviour from sin. And when you come to him, you may offer your urgent needs. You may come with your paralysis. You may come with your bereavement. You may come with your broken family or your addiction or your depression or your guilt or your lust or whatever else it is that, that drags you down that seems like such an unjust suffering, an unjust situation for you to find yourself in. And yet Jesus won't first respond by dealing with that pressing, urgent issue. He will first respond by dealing with your greatest need. That is to provide forgiveness for your sin. Here's a comfort though as we end. For this paralyzed man, once he was forgiven, what happened next? Jesus, being willing to forgive him, Jesus being able to forgive him, was also willing and able to restore strength to his legs. You know, for every believer, there's this promise. For those who have come to Jesus and received his willing and able forgiveness for our sins, there's this hope that every ailment, every unjust suffering, every difficulty, every persecution will one day be made right. And we will enjoy life far beyond any life we've even dreamt or imagined here today. It's coming. And he is able because he is a saviour. We're going to conclude our worship by singing, actually, a psalm. Psalm 130. I think the words are going to come up on the screen. And the psalm begins with this statement, Out of the depths I call to you. The psalm doesn't explicitly describe what those depths are from which the psalmist calls. And many worshippers surely has used this psalm over the years to describe their call to God from the depths of all sorts of situations. Yet the joy in this psalm that we're going to sing together, the gladness that comes to the worshipper, comes because out of the depths they have found forgiveness of sin. And however murky, however deep, however dark those depths they are sunk in, there is this one hope which shines brighter than all the others. My sin has been forgiven. Let's stand and sing Psalm 130 in praise to our Saviour Jesus. After you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen.